start recording. And thank you so much for being here. This is part of our COVID-19 response. We have so many tools that we've developed over the years. Uh, I love that punching ball that you have there. I'm going to put myself <laughs> in the pin. And uh, over the years, I've been through so many turmoils. I started with the uh, the collapse of Venezuelan economy, and then I I had the where well, I lost all my money, and uh, and then I had other very very stressful situations. Uh, I lost money when I was in Chile as well. I lost money during the global financial crisis, and. I go up and I go down and it's like a roller coaster, but things are going to be okay. And as I said to the group that is working with me building a hotel, I'm building a large hotel with other partners and everybody was so, so stressful that two weeks ago we had to say, let's take a break. This is a historic moment. We're making history and we need to be kind to each other. Our purpose is to survive to be able to tell others what we did during COVID-19. Because uh, we're gonna talk about that like our parents or grandparents talked about the war, if they survive. So that is our purpose. Um, we are doing a series of webinars. Um, and we started with the first one was about how do you find uh, you, your inner locus of control, which is I think what we needed most. The second one uh, was about uh, angel investing and why this is a great opportunity to be an angel investor. And this one is about pivoting. We're gonna do another one about the uh, forecasting where the economy is growing so we can go towards that instead of looking backwards because you can't go forward if you're turning around looking at your past and thinking, I wish the past stayed like that. We just need to jump in and create the world that we want to create. So uh, a couple of things, um, Dan is here, he's our COO. So if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand because he's watching. Or you can go here to the chat and ask questions there. Uh, we can ask questions in English or Spanish because we have people of both uh, languages. You can ask in any, lang any language, but I might not understand. And with this, I'm gonna start the presentation. I'm gonna ask you to do a couple of exercises like, uh, like I usually do. And um, thank you so, so much for being here. This is, uh, this is just uh, pretty good. This is pretty good. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna start with let me just see if we can start here. I'm going to start with the topic. Ta -da! Yeah. And the topic of the day is, uh, let me just see this. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have yeah, we have uh, recordings of all the webinars. Uh, so the topic is pivoting. And pivoting is like this weird thing. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're giving you tools so you can go and execute. And it doesn't matter. If you're an entrepreneur, you need to pivot if you're an employee as well. We'll talk about that. So pivoting is an art and a science. And it is all about shifting your business model to adapt quickly because you probably have no other choice. Um, I'm gonna start with, uh, with the agenda. We're gonna briefly talk about why, more like a funny uh, comments. Uh, and then we're gonna write uh, get right in into how do you execute. We're going to go to what are the steps? How do you set the intention? How do you brainstorm? How do you engage the people? Test rapidly. And how do you find support? And we are here to support anybody that we can because we are not going to be an expectator of reality. We are actors of our destiny. So we're going to go jump in in any way that we can help you. So once upon a time, I'm going to start with this uh, sort of short story. There's a joke uh, about a guy who had a ton of money and had a lavish, lavish party. And uh, he got a little drunk and he said, I want to find the bravest person in the whole party. And I have a pool infested with crocodiles. Whoever jumps in the pool, I'll give that person 
a quarter of my wealth and, and nobody paid any attention to that. And as the night progressed, he started adding more things. I'll give them a, a villa in Spain. I'll, I'll give them an airplane. I'll give whoever it is. And, and, and then he got very frustrated and he said, I can't believe nobody, we don't have any person here that is brave enough to jump in. Uh, so this is, you know, this is very disappointing. As it night goes in and goes in, he gets more and more frustrated. He adds more things. And he's, he's saying, I, we're all woozies. Nobody has any respect. Uh, I cannot believe that. We, we all say that we're great people. And then suddenly they hear a splash in the pool. And there's a bottle in the pool and somebody gets out. And he says, oh, my brave, my brave man. Uh, I, I envy you, you are the reason why I exist. Tell me, what do you want? I'll give you everything because you are the leader. And, and the poor guy looks at him and says, I just want one thing. I only want one thing. He said, just tell me, tell me, I'll give you whatever you want. And he says, I wanna find the person that pushed me into the pool. And that is the way we are now. We've been pushed into a pool of crocodiles where nobody wanted to be. And sometimes we projected that, but we never thought it was gonna come. So now that we are in that pool, we just need to shift our focus from how did we get here to how do we get out? And that is the most important shift in our focus. I. Um, I myself, I'm very, very frustrated about many of the decisions that were made. And uh, I decided I'm gonna stop criticizing that and I'm gonna use my time to create the new world. And that's when I met my team and we decided we're gonna uh, dive right in and we're gonna go and support the ecosystem. So um, how do we do that has a lot to do with one of my best classes in, uh, in, my, um, in my MBA. And I've spoken about that class uh, for a long time. Mary Pinard gave us a poetry class and I thought that was the most stupid thing to learn at an MBA. It was in the first quarter. And we worked extensively creating poems. We were nine, eight or nine people from all over the world. Um, we made jokes. I was the only one that spoke Spanish. There was a guy uh, from Russia too. Uh, and there was a guy from Italy. And we made jokes and, and we, you know, we talked about poetry and we had to do a final uh, presentation and we didn't know how it was. And Mary just, she drove us through just exercising and exercising and exercising and exercising. And Right before the presentation, the Saturday before the presentation, we had a grueling 10 hour meeting. And now for me, it was very stressful because I have my kids at home and I want to get back home. And um, we worked and worked and worked and worked. When we thought that our poems were perfect, she told us, I'm gonna give you the best gift you will ever get at this MBA. And she gave us a pair of scissors and a little scotch tape. And she said, break up your poem. And I was one of them that says, I'm not doing this. You know how long it took me to write this thing? I've been working on, on months. I, I, this is hard for me. It is beautiful. And she said, no, no, no. And whilst I was arguing for, with her, some of my classmates were chopping up their poems and putting these words around, and they were creating a pile. And I spent some time arguing with uh, Mary, and I said, no, you, you can't get me to do that. And uh, those of you that know me, you know that I can be very stubborn. I have a very strong internal locus of control. And I said, no, 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 this was a great poem. And I said, I wanna copy it, and then I'll tear it down. And she said, no, 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 you have to trust. You have to trust the system. And I'm like, I don't trust the system. I don't trust my capacity to create a poem this beautiful again. And after a while I gave up and I said, okay, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna do that. So we chopped that. And we created a pile with all the words. And then together we started working on the poem that we created together. And that 
was the most important class for me in the whole MBA. And the learning for me was that sometimes you have to destroy what you created, break down the pieces, put them together to create something that is much better. But for me, it was just a poem. But for many people, it's their livelihood. When I have managed my companies and some other companies in situations that things are not working, I always go back to Mary Pinard's poetry class and I always say, let's bring down, let's break this down in pieces and see how can we recreate the stories that we want to create. And in these, in these times, in this crisis, this is like a puzzle where we had all the pieces neatly uh, glued together and then somebody came and shuttered the puzzle, took some pieces out and we're left with the pieces without knowing how we're gonna create it back. And that is the moment that we're living right now. So those two things turn us into how did we create the puzzle to begin with? And this is a model that I developed to help teach entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is nothing else than turning opportunities into something that we can execute and sometimes we don't have that. Uh, this is based on a previous model called the Timmons model. And Timon, Jeff Timon was the founder of the Center for Entrepreneurship at Harvard. And he was the founder for the Center of Entrepreneurship at Babson. And I really, really like him. And he had his model of entrepreneurship was a table with three legs. And one leg was the market, one leg was the team and the operations, and one leg was the funding. And I thought a lot about his model. And maybe because I'm Latina, but I always found that he was missing the passion the passion that shines through in the entrepreneurial activities, the passion that makes entrepreneurs do things that are incredible and think and think and think, how am I going to create this dream? How do I turn this dream into a goal so I can execute? And so I separated the model a little bit and I put the passion of the team here, not just the founder. So, with this model, we're gonna start understanding how do we pivot? And if the model is broken, what we are left with are different pieces of these answers that are scattered all over, and we need to reorganize that. So there's five steps to pivoting. The first one is to set the intention to add value. The second one is to brainstorm with a point of leverage. Is it the market or the operations? And I'll explain every one of them. The third one is to engage people. In these times, it's not the CEO or the leader that makes the decisions. We are all in the pool together. We have different boats, but we are all in these storms together. So it's not one person's accountability to solve the issues is everybody's accountability. The fourth step is to prototype and prototype. And prototyping is to come up with a formula or a model that we can share without executing to improve it. But the way to do that is not to be attached to the prototype because the whole purpose of that is to create something that we need to refine. So it's like a, it's like a raw diamond. And prototype in, is when we have something that we can uh, already start selling. And we will improve it a little bit better, but we can start selling. And the last part is to get support. What is the support that we need? And that is when sometimes consultants come handy or other references or books. So those are the five steps to pivoting. Add value, brainstorm, engage people, test, and get support. So we are going to start, and I'm going to put you to work, but let's start with setting the intention. And this is really, really critical. The intention in pivoting is not to save your assets. 
is to add value. How do you add value? Who needs you? And we will go that we will dive deeper into how do we execute this. So when we set the intention that we're going to add value, we start aligning everything into a fit. So you remember where we had the model that they have the four different parts. So we start doing the market, the product, and the team, and then we'll see how we're going to find it. Once we realign everything, it's easier to start executing. But it is very important that we set the intention, the intention looking forward, because we're going to add value. We're not going to save the past. The past is gone. We're never going to be the same. This is like saying we had a different life before electricity and after electricity. And this is the new normal for us. We had a different life before plumbing and after plumbing. We had a different life before education and with education. We have a different life before internet and with internet. And now we have a different life before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. And the sooner we jump on board, the better it's gonna be for us and for everybody else. So there's two ways to add value. One is to look at the market, and these are the questions. What is the need of the market? What are the alternatives? Who are the customers? How to reach the clients? And I separate customers pay you and uh, customers use your service or users and clients pay you, but some people have different ways of uh, analyzing these words. What is the price or the value? What is the sales cycle? And when do you receive the payment? All of these are questions that help you define where is the market. The other questions are about the operations, is how do you produce, deliver, uh, who are your partners, uh, how much do you spend, and when do you pay, and how do you reach your clients? So those are related to the operations. What are your capacities to create something and deliver and service others? So one is about the need, and the other one is about your response to that need. In Chile, I lived in Chile for seven years, and in Chile, they have a saying that is right here, aquí, ahora, y con lo que tengo. Right here, right now, with whatever I've got right now. So you start pivoting, not with the past or with the future. You start pivoting with the present. Where are you now? And how, what are the resources that you have? Because there's some that you no longer have. So for example, restaurants don't have uh, customers that sit down. So that's not what they have. They have chairs, they have tables, they have kitchens, but they don't have the capacity to have people. How do we put all of these together? Is um, It's a matter of brainstorm. So, when we brainstorm, we look at the market and we discover the new needs. And the new needs are the needs of the people that we usually serve. How have their needs changed? And we also look at the operations and we discover new applications. So for example, the new needs of clients in uh, business, in the business world, is to meet virtually. So it's the same market, but now we're meeting virtually. That means we need better internet. That means we need collaborative systems, either Zoom that we're using now, but a lot of people use Zoom, but also have other forms of capturing information. We've seen a search in Slack and uses of anything that is collaborative, like Plus Plus is a new company that I'm invested and they have a software that allows people to connect and to share knowledge. So now we're seeing a spike in those markets because those are new needs that emerge after we change the situation. We also look at the operation and we discover new applications. So they, probably the most common one is all these people or all these factories that manufacture clothing 
they're doing face masks or they doing or the restaurants are doing takeaways but there's some things that you can't do you can't for example take away a haircut or you can't take away a construction so there are other things that we start thinking about but when you brainstorm to pivot those are the two angles and uh, um I'm gonna give you um, probably a minute to think. I'm gonna put some music. And I'm gonna give you a minute to think about markets and operations in ways that is useful to your particular uh, situation. And then, um, and then you can start uh, sharing that. And I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put a romantic, uh, I'm going to put a romantic uh, song called Me Dediqué a Perderte, <laughs> because that's what happened. We lost the clients. But uh, I'll give you this uh, a minute to think about that. Just think about the new needs of the market in Europe and your logistics. What are the things that you can give people? Okay, so I don't know if any of you would like to share some things that they found that they could use to pivot in terms of marketing or in terms of operations or logistics. Uh, I know some of you have companies that really require people to be present, so that's more challenging. And I'll tell you how to work with that in a few minutes. Anybody wants to? Share. Gladys. Sí, Alicia. Um, well. I have to change all my process. So I am also trying to learn more about Facebook ads and how I, I learned about that new word. I did I never hear about remarketing. So I want to know more about that and how I can integrate the Facebook, Facebook ads with another software. Tomorrow I have a meeting with a friend that will teach me about that because it's, I need to be more virtual. I need to use more of the tools that I have for you know. And also I have a plan to prepare a seminar about, uh, well, part of my job is about financial um, uh, advice and part of it is life insurance. And I will focus, now, I'm, I'm feeling that the people of course have more um, life insurance in mind 
and I'm preparing a seminar. I never did a virtual seminar before. <laughs> a lot of meetings, video conference, but I am thinking to practice with friends first. <laughs> and then um, sign to starting to start to promote it. Um, I need to change. I need to reinvent myself. We don't have any other option. No, no option. No, no other option. So maybe, maybe your company is creating a new product. Uh, I don't know, but uh, yeah, we don't have. Uh, there's no other option. We can. Yes, yeah. I have to. If I have, if I want to survive, I have to. There's no option. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not only survive to grow, really. Yeah, it's a time to survive. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. but. That's not the word that I would like to use. If I want to w w grow, grow, yes, uh huh. That's because exactly. I won't that's survive. Exactly. It's I. I will be okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. That that's a great approach. It's not to survive. It's to grow. To continue growing. Good. Good. Uh, anybody else? Julie. Go ahead. Hey. Um, so um, something that we've been working on is, you know, supply chain, right? A lot of supply chains, especially, you know, within hardware are extremely centralized um, and ex extremely global. And, um, you know, which got me to think about, you know, there are certain things that in your supply chain pipeline, there are certain things that require a lot of um, capital and um, in capital investments. But at a certain part, there's other um, parts of that supply chain where it becomes more localized. And I don't know, I've just been kind of noodling with the idea that, you know, are there, um, you know, emerging now markets that kind of help decentralize kind of that distribution a little bit and, and actually create a new platform where you can have a little bit more, more localized customization? Because that's another thing that I'm seeing so much of, right, is just because we have a lot of uh, sensing technologies and a lot of data, personalized data, the ability, um, there's no other time in the course of history that we have such a ability to customize experiences. And now I think the next wave is physical devices. Mm -hmm. well, how do you do that in a way that's scalable, right? Because if you have centralized um, manufacturing systems, it's actually very difficult to customize it. So I, I, I'm actually pretty excited and kind of thinking along those lines of, you know, possibilities in there. So that is, uh, thank you. That is, that is great. Uh, one, one thing that people don't uh, know is that the plague that, that wiped out I think a third of the population in Europe uh, created the need for better jobs and created a more fair society for people because before People either had land or they were serves and they couldn't, they needed to grow their food. And because of the lack of labor, all the labor uh, laws and the protection of labor was created after the plague. Um, the other thing that came after that was the Industrial Revolution. And that ties in with what you were saying, Julie, because before we used to do everything by hand and after the war, uh, we just didn't have the population. So we had to be creative about having, for example, nails. Imagine people used to create every single nail to that specific product. And they started um, standardizing a lot of things. So everybody built on top of that. So this creates a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities for, um, for reinvention. This is exciting. Uh, anybody else? So we're going to continue with, uh, we're going to continue with, uh, we, go ahead. Yeah, we have a, a business uh, that we do medical interpretation. Um, basically, we are now uh, developing um, an application for bringing all that virtually. We were thinking about that before the, the virus, but then, uh, uh, obviously we are accelerating and in fact we're already working with some clinics uh, 
with this. Or the, it just, I mean, it was obvious, uh, like before, that this was something that was coming. But uh, now uh, we are working very hard on getting some capital to be able to provide this service that now we are providing uh, with our, you know, with but let's say manually somehow we we already providing the service but we want to to grow and and bring uh, i mean this uh medical interpretation and potentially other areas of interpretation uh, nationwide and worldwide in in an application uh, with human interpretation as the main uh the front end because in, in the case of medical interpretation you need uh, human interpretation to start with so that's what we are involved now well the, the the good news is that those types of applications are now getting a lot of funding because people need to come up with solutions for part of the crisis which is the medical emergencies yeah. and the and the translations of medical of people that don't speak uh the language that the doctors speak so that is that is another example of of how we can pivot but also the other thing is that financial capital is supporting those things so i'm i many many of you know that i'm an investor and we continue to see companies we just saw 58 last uh last month that they applied to san Angeles. i saw 12 outside so they continue to continue to invest in. I personally think being an angel investor is the best because you can influence the outcome because they listen to you. And also because they are so dynamic that they can pivot easily. It's much, much more, much easier to pivot a company that is young than to pivot a company that is large than Facebook, for example. It's just harder. Or, or a bank, it's just harder. But we see a lot of potential in new applications. So let me, thank you, Carlos. I don't know if anybody wants to uh, add something else, but I wanna, I wanna move forward to, to the positive of the changes. So the other step is that each person counts. So the employees and the suppliers count, the collaborators count. So for example, when Gladys was saying, you know, I'm learning how to do Facebook ads, maybe there's another person that has this company that serves the same market and you can bundle services together that might not be in the same area. I always put, the example of the great cappuccinos as great coffee but it has to have great milk and it has to have a great uh, processing and a great frother so there are collaborators they, they don't compete with each other but together they have a lot of synergies um, and you have to continue focusing on adding value and getting out and, uh, and be proactive and i have to make uh, a I have to make a parenthesis here to explain the difference between accountability and responsibility. Uh, I, you know, entrepreneurs are very, very accountable and proactive. And when you start a company, when I've started my companies, I want to have in my initial team, I want to have people who are accountable. And the difference, for example, is that if you're walking around and you see a piece of paper on the floor, you might not be responsible for that piece of paper. You might not be the person that threw the paper or the person that has to clean it up. So you're not responsible for that. But if it bothers you and you feel accountable, you pick it up and you put it somewhere. Uh, when we started having the problems with racism and immigration here in, in the US, I realized that I had to take an active role whenever I saw the police or whenever I saw somebody being uh being rationally profiled or being being uh talked to in an aggressive way uh, so i took that as okay i need to be accountable because i have something that i can add when we decided to do this webinar 
that was another sign. We are accountable for the solution. So we're going to add our piece. I cannot individually help everybody, but I know that this helps, this gives a different view and, and helps propel forward. So why is this important for you is that if you start asking people and having conversations about solutions, you engage them. And there, is, there are some companies that have told employees, you, you can leave and we'll pay you something, but they're not actively engaging the employees in finding solutions. Uh, for example, I have my cleaner here that I told her you need to stay home, which she just had a baby, you need to stay home. But I was telling her, maybe there's something else that you can do, uh, but she just works as a cleaner. She's extremely smart, but she's getting trained in something else because she wants to get out of this. If you have a company, for example, if you have a company that sells directly to consumers, my, uh, my son-in-law has an insurance company. He sent everybody home and he says, okay, we need to be smarter about this. And he started doing webinars. And sometimes the webinars are about how to play with your kids. It's just being engaged into let's find the needs that people have and let's offer them some solution to their needs. And that's how you start creating the new model, which is much healthier than staying at home complaining or criticizing or being frustrated or being sad about the situation and how it affects negatively to most people. I mean, we are privileged to be here. We're not working in the stores or in the grocery stores. We're not first responders. So we're very fortunate to be here. We're fortunate to have internet, to be able to, to talk, to communicate. But so we, we are privileged and we can be part of that solution. So how do we start working? And this is, this is everything that I've set up to this point leads to this graphic and uh, um, just start thinking about that. So we have two, two axes. We have the operations axis and then we say, well, what is difficult and what is easy? And then we have the market access, which are the needs of our customers. The operations are what our capabilities, what we can do, and the market is what is needed in the market. So what is urgent and what has been postponed. So when you, when you create this, you have this blue ocean here, and then you have the red ocean here, the, the, the part where everybody's bleeding. For example, dining, air travel, all of that now is difficult and has been postponed. You don't want to be here. You want to start moving here. Um, also, uh, uh, urgent surgeries, weldings, lab work, they probably are urgent. You need to have that done, but they're difficult to perform because we are in social uh, isolation, uh, social distancing. Uh, haircuts, for example, they're difficult in today's uh, situation because, because of hygiene. So there's things that are not that urgent, but they're difficult. So you don't want to be in this in these block either. Um, and there are things that are postponed and they're easy. For example, you can do cooking classes. And a lot of people are taking cooking classes, but they're not willing to pay for that. Uh, there's, there's training as well. Uh, and some training is urgent. For example, Zoom training has become urgent. There's a lot of people training people on how to use Zoom. Education is urgent. There's people that need to be graduating. There's people in schools that they need to uh, continue to grow. So any service to certified education is becoming more urgent and it's, it's relatively easy, but it's easier than, than this part because we have internet, we have the tools, we have the educators, and we can do social distancing through education. But what has really popped up is virtual teams, everything that has to do with virtual teams, um, personal protection uh, equipment production. So you see a lot of companies that are shifting to produce, uh, you know, personal equipment for nurses. This is, this is kind of easy or transport. How do you take it from one place to another? There's other things like disinfecting uh, chambers. Uh, we had, uh, during the, at the, at the onset of the crisis, uh, we had calls. In, I remember one Saturday, I had like six calls with different companies all together because we are trying to, jump up and, and be very well prepared 
and there's a lot of technology companies here in Silicon Valley, but they have to be together because that's how you build new stuff. And um, so I had one company that creates the big blades for for the uh, the, the molinos, the air, uh, the energy, the only energy, the humongous blades. They have a 3D printing uh, space here in San Jose. So they immediately started. Uh, they immediately called me up and said, we have the capacity to 3D print something. What can we do? And then I have another company that has robotics and they send robotics around and they had robotics serving hotels. The hotels are closed. They were saying, well, we don't think we're going to continue serving our customers, but um, do you have any use for these? So they're picking that up and using those robots to go and transfer things in hospitals. And then this other company said, well, we can print uh, things around these robots so they can put some samples so people don't have to be running around. And then they say, well, we can also put ultralight, uh, ultraviolet light so they can disinfect things. So immediately four or five completely different companies got together, Samsung jumped in, got together and said, okay, we are gonna start working on these. Apple and Google started working together. Apple is, uh, most people here that have small smartphones have Apples. Apple has geolocation uh, services in the phone and Google has this humongous uh, software capability. So they started working together to see if we can track people who have been uh, positive in a different way. So they're, they're just working towards having other solutions. But what you want to be, and this applies to different things, but what you want to be, you want to be here. What is urgent and what is easy for you to do? What do you have the capabilities and what is urgently needed in the market? And sometimes this is just for the next two or three months. And sometimes it's a completely shift where you say, we're never going to go back to the old ways. Uh, but for example, if you're building houses, you might have to stop building houses, but everybody that works with your company can have, if they have a phone, can help somebody else to fix a problem in their house. So you can very quickly pivot and say, okay, our staff is going to allow you to solve problems in your house because now you can't have somebody, or at least here, you can't have somebody come and fix things in your house, but people are staying more at home, so they have the capacity to fix things. And what are they going to use? They're probably going to go and use YouTube, but maybe they need something else. Um, some of the companies that I've invested in are taking their whole teams that work in logistics, in this part of the operations, the whole team, and they are analyzing how they can support the problems, the logistic problems, for example, in food, transport, and medical, medical equipment. Air travel also has shifted that. So you see 98% of air travel has been canceled, but the airlines are taking medical supplies and volunteers here and there. The same thing has happened with hotels. So the hotels, some have shut down, some have said, we're only gonna have the first floor, but then there is a problem with the healthcare professionals that they don't want to go back and infect their family. So they need a place to stay. So hotels are shifting to first responder hotels. They're shifting the whole disinfecting processes. And then they have nurses and cleaners and doctors staying at their, at their rooms instead of going to their home. So that's, a, that's pivoting. That's part of the pivoting. The other thing that is happening is a lot of restaurants, for example, are doing takeaways. And, or takeouts, depending on which country. And they are having, uh, at least here, in, well, every, in, everywhere, they're having uh, tables outside to take away, and they're having special boxes for people who have to work. For example, the people that transport uh, pa packages, or people that are nurses, or people that are cleaners, people that have to go out and work. Instead of going home, they just go and grab it back and they leave and they take that back. And people are paying for that. So people like me or people like our neighborhoods 
we don't want these small stores to close, but they don't want to get sick either. So they have a limited stock and they're putting outside on the tables food to go, or if you order something, uh, you, you just take it out to the, to the, uh, to the um, sidewalk and you take it from there. So those are things that people are doing. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking, for example, Italy, I, my mom was born in Florence and I have some cousins in Italy and they're, they're really suffering because they can't leave. And I was telling one of them, why don't you start giving um, Italian classes or singing? And you've seen all the, the, you know, the operas and the singing and people giving free classes for others on the balconies. So why can't we as society say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start paying one or two dollars and we're gonna watch these people talk about Italian history or Italian language or Italian cooking that is really yummy or that could be in so many ways. But the trick here is to stop looking at the past and start looking at, okay, how do we create the new future and move towards that future together? And um, how you start pr prioritizing, this is what we did in, in our uh, Wealth Institute. Um, we did education and training, and this is part of what we're doing. We're just giving free webinars, uh, but, I really encourage you to start drawing in this chart, what are the things that you can do now, focusing on this particular quadrant here and letting go of the ones that are too difficult because you don't have the capabilities of doing and you can't find somebody to come and jump in with you or the decisions that have been postponed until later because people are focusing on the urgent. So those are the things. The trick here is not to stop. Um, when, you've, when you've seen me teach creativity, I always say that the worst enemy of creativity is a good idea. Because once you start developing a good idea, you, start, you stop looking for ideas. So make sure that when you brainstorm, you just add as many ideas in, and then you start changing the ideas a little bit to, to add more flair and more color uh, suggestions and that's how you reach to something that you can do that is unique and that you can actually execute. Um, and the, the other thing is that you need to start prototyping and prototyping is putting in one piece of paper what you think you're gonna do is very basic. Uh, you don't know all the answers. It's like reassembling your, your puzzle with missing pieces. You will not have the pieces because this is a crisis. Uh, but you start assembling that and you do a rapid testing. You start asking the people if you, if these would be useful to them and you start discarding rapidly. You remember what I told you, if it's too difficult or it has been, the decision has been postponed, just discard it and continue going and reuse and recycle everything that you did here. Julie, when you were talking about uh, customization, I think we're going to see a surge in reuse and recycle because the supply chain is broken and not a lot of people are seeing that, you know, we're going to start seeing recycling and reusing and a surge in manual labor because we're just not going to be able to comply with, with the things that we're used to and our, our supply chain is, is broken. Um, and remember that it's a roller coaster. So grab onto yourself worth, uh, you know, it's like, your attitude is going to define you more than anything else. Uh, not how well you look, how rich you are, how many, how many posts do you get? People are getting much more comfortable with what is your self-worth, is, is how do you feel about yourself and how kind you are to others. Uh, so this is, this is a really, really difficult crisis. And for many people, it's, uh, these are times of uncertainty. And, uh, Instead of sharing news about, you know, so many entrepreneurs that put all of their money and, and, and uh, you know, energy and hard work in getting into companies that are most likely going to have to pivot, let's give them a hand and make some suggestions so they can pivot. And I uh, started doing, uh, exercising your entrepreneurial thought and action is, is that, okay, when I don't have anything, I can't lose myself. I, you still have yourself. That's, that's the goal. You keep yourself um, 
through the ups and the downs, sometimes just uh, get a pat in the back. Focus on solutions and don't do magic. People are your, they can be your best alliances and, uh, and people are so innovative and creative, so encourage that and uh, rest. So at the end, this, this, a friend of mine gave me this uh, when I was going through a hard time, when I, I was actually sick. And she said, at the end, everything is fine. If it's not fine, it's not the end. So we just need to keep breathing and, uh, uh, and, and working towards that. I particularly, I'm not the type of person that is resisting the storm. Uh, I learned through hardships that it's easier to be like the water and not like the rock. And um, a friend of mine who lived in Saudi Arabia, she told me once that uh, she had learned that the hard way too, and it had a big impact in me. She said, you know, I used to be strong like a rock. And she said, well, I don't want to be strong like a rock because I get hammered all the time. I want to be like water. So there's, oh, there's an obstacle here. Oh, that's fine. I go this way. Oh, there's another obstacle here. That's fine. I go this way. So it's just trying to be more uh, flexible and, and, and be just kinder. I think it's the way uh, to do. So in summary, um, we didn't spend too much talking about the why because we were thrown in these together. But how do we do that? These are the five, five steps. You set the intention to add value, not to protect your assets. You brainstorm in terms of market and logistics or operations. You engage others. Uh, you test, you do rapid testing, and you discard what is going to be too difficult or what is going to be postponed. And you get the support. And, and that's it. If you want any questions, you have any questions, we're here. Um, Danny is here too. Uh, we, have, uh, we have our website, wealthing.com. We are very excited about being actors of our destiny and not sitting down in the couch, criticizing and complaining. I do criticize and I complain, but I snap out of it because every second that I use to criticize and complain is a second I didn't use to create something that was useful or to rest or to or to rest so with this um i'm going to stop the recording and uh, actually i'm going to open it for a few questions and then i'll stop the recording but i want to see if you have any comments any questions any suggestions how can, can we you help you how we can make this better can you hear me Alisa? uh who are you Uba. As, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm gonna. Yeah. Keep <laughs> so no, the, um, no. First of all, thank you. This is this is great. You know, and I just wanted to say that. And um, you know, one of the things that caught my eye, you talk about the rapid prototyping and all that, and it's such an important concept because you know, for us who come from the um, corporate world. And large corporations usually, you know, want everything. They want to know beforehand what is what they're gonna do. You know, when they hire someone, they want someone who has done it before. Guess why they cannot come up with anything original? Because you know they are just terrified of doing something that may not not work, right? So, so it's so important that if you're trying to do something really innovative, something really different that you're willing to do the thing where you don't know exactly what you're gonna end up with, but you put something together, a little toy prototype that, you know, works and, and you know, once it works, then you know that you're on the right path and you're gonna be able to that. Right, but thank you for putting this together, very inspiring as well, right? Thank you, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>